the weather. Hello there, I'm Eamon. And I'm Isabel. And you're watching the GB News digital stream across the United Kingdom. And around the world. If you're here in the UK, you can also watch us on your TV screen. GB News is Freeview Channel 236. On Sky, we're Channel 515. 626 on Virgin Media. Just remember, you might need to retune your TV to watch the channel. Yeah, and if you are doing that, find out more about retuning by going to gbnews.uk. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. It's Mark Dolan, it's GB News, and I'm very excited because it's the second instalment of Weekend Headliners tonight with GB News' very own Andrew Doyle and the brilliant comedian Josh Howey. Lots to get through, but first, here's Simon with the headlines. Thanks, Mark. Yes, I'm Simon Pusey, and here are your latest headlines. Boris Johnson says he recognises the terrible toll COVID has had on the UK after the latest figures were released. A further 313 deaths were reported today, which takes the UK's death toll to over 150,000 since the pandemic began. Labour leader Sakir Starmer tweeted, this number was a dark milestone for our country. UK experts say a fourth COVID jab is not yet needed as boosters are 90% effective in people over 65 after three months. Dr Catherine Millington-Sanders told GB News a second booster is not currently necessary. Court documents show tennis player Novak Djokovic, who is fighting deportation from Australia, tested positive for coronavirus last month. His lawyers claim he was granted a vaccine exemption to enter the country because of the recent infection. Czech tennis player Renata Vorakova, who was also detained at an immigration facility in Melbourne, left Australia today after visa issues. Two teenage boys have been charged with manslaughter and arson after the death of an 88-year-old woman. Josephine Smith was pronounced dead at the scene following a fire at an address in Romford in Essex. 18-year-old Kai Cooper from Surrey and a 15-year-old boy from Essex have been remanded in custody and will appear at the Old Bailey on Tuesday. At least 22 people, including tourists, have died in freezing temperatures after being stranded in their vehicles in northern Pakistan. Most of the victims died of hypothermia. Around 1,000 vehicles are still stranded after more than four feet of snow fell in the area overnight. The government has declared the resort town of Murray, northeast of the capital, a calamity hit area. More than 50,000 homes are without power on the west coast of the U.S. following flooding. Areas of Washington state experienced several days of heavy rainfall, causing roads to be rushed away and houses submerged. Members of the National Guard have been sent in to protect properties. 
The final section of the revolutionary James Webb Space Telescope has been successfully deployed. Real-time animation shows the most complex stage of the process, the final set of mirrors unfolding and latching onto the main mirror surface. The $9 billion telescope, which launched on Christmas Day, was built to give the world a glimpse of the universe as it existed when the first galaxies formed. And ahead of her 40th birthday tomorrow, the Duchess of Cambridge has released three official portraits. Kate Middleton poses in three different Alexander McQueen dresses and earrings that belong to Princess Diana for fashion photographer Paolo Rovetti. The photos were taken at Kew Gardens in November last year and will enter the permanent collection of the National Portrait Gallery. You are right up to date. Now back to Headliners. Hello, I'm Mark Dolan, and this is Headliners. Before we take you on a comical journey through the papers, let's have a look at Sunday's headlines. And let's start with The Observer. End mass jabs and treat COVID like we do flu, says a former vaccine chief. Um, and Djokovic pictures add to visa controversy. Novak Djokovic faced fresh controversy yesterday over his attempt to enter Australia to take part in the Open Tennis Tournament after pictures emerged on social media of his appearances at public events in mid-December. OK, let's move on to The Telegraph now. The Sunday Telegraph trusts I will use Article 16 if EU won't bend. Of course, the Foreign Secretary Liz Truss is responsible for those negotiations with the EU about that invisible border down the Irish Sea. And the Prime Minister to escape damaging flat makeover investigation. And Duchess dares to dazzle at 40. Uh, that's uh, Kate Middleton, who uh, I think probably wears that dress quite well, if I'm honest with you. So uh, happy birthday to Kate Middleton. Next up, we've got the independent oil industry to help write rules on new drilling. Oil and gas firms were invited by the government to help write the rules on whether new drilling complies with the UK's climate targets just weeks after the PM urged countries to stop extracting fossil fuels at COP26. The Mirror, more pictures of Kate at 40. And Dyer's soap bombshell. Danny quits EastEnders. BBC show in crisis as another top star leaves EastEnders. Uh, Danny Dyer there to leave one of Britain's most successful soaps. The Sunday Times, end of free lateral flow tests as country told to live with COVID, one of the better headlines we've seen in 2022. The Sunday Express, pretty, it's time for tough justice or tougher justice. The House of Lords must not water down new police powers because the country owes it to victims' families to tackle the scourge of knife crime. And last but not least, the Daily Star on a Sunday. Well, this is a turn up for the books. Yuri Geller and the Temple of Spoons. Indiana Jones could get his arcs whipped by Yuri Geller. The star's favourite spoon bender says he knows where the religious relic is and he plans to dig it up soon. Cutlery botherer, I've found lost ark. You've got to hand it to the star on Sunday for a bit of light relief, which is certainly what this show is all about. Hello and welcome to Headliners. Now, what do you call one of the greatest comedic minds of our time? Renowned across the world, a pioneer, an intellectual giant, a behemoth. I call that man Dave Chappelle. Anyway, here's Andrew Doyle. And a man with more offspring than Genghis Khan, the famously fertile Josh Howey. Hello, uh, but they are all consensual. I just well, they you know, are. Genghis Khan's weren't all consensual. Uh, just from history books and stuff. And I think they're watching, actually. Hello. And by they the are, way, we've done you a great disservice because it's not enough just to be fertile. You have to be attractive, too. Otherwise, there's very little to do with that fertility, as I discovered after four years at university. Yes. So. I, yes Whereas so. you, how many kids have you got? I've got five. Count? They are watching right now. And I'm proud to say that because they're watching, we are beating Sky and BBC. <laughs> we certainly <laughs> are. I think we've doubled our audience. <laughs> Thanks to the Howies. <laughs> And Josh Howe, Josh Howie's here, of course, and so is Andrew Doyle. Now, Andrew, uh, how's your how's your day been? How's it hanging, as they it's, say? Uh, well, it's hanging well. I mean, I'm I am well. I'm I've had a sort of forced miserable because I'm doing dry January, so I've made myself well, miserable. No, no wonder you're so grumpy. That's why I'm grumpy. You know, normally I'd be full of beans and drunk. 
Yeah. Uh, but as it is, I'm, I'm you're, sober and... You're doing heroin, so... Well, I mean, obviously, you've got, yeah, to, you've yeah, got, to, have a, you've got to have a vice. Yeah. You know? By the yeah. way, yeah, explain to kids what heroin is. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. That is a natural antidote. Well, listen, uh, just say no, folks, if you're watching at home, because uh, you don't want to turn out like Andrew, let's be honest. Uh, the Observer leads with ending mass jabs and treating COVID like flu. Uh, what are your thoughts on this, Josh? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a big deal. And the fact that it's coming from uh, The Observer, I think, is actually even, an even bigger deal. Mm. I think it's changing the narrative of what's going on now. I think they're finally pointing a way out of it. If, if The Observer's talking about this stuff, then you know that... that uh, the yeah, because I get that the sort of left-leaning press have been sort of pretty supportive of lockdown measures, haven't they, for the last couple of years? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, The Observer is, isn't The Guardian. I mean, it's mm. the same offices and stuff like that, but it is, they are much better on a lot of issues. But um, this is, this is the, the, the guy who came up, who sort of led the, um, the, the charge to get the vaccines. So mm. it's coming from him. This person knows what he's talking about and he knows that this is how we're going to move yeah. forward. Yeah, I think there was a big moment this week when the head of the JCVI, who are the government's vaccine advisory body, who said, we can't just keep boosting people every no, 10 exactly. minutes. And I, mean, I not... thought that was a refreshing moment. And this guy is not some nutter on the internet no, in his mum's bedroom. That's the point. And then here today with the Observer uh, quoting Clive Dix about this, these are big figures. Mm. People who are coming out and saying, no, actually, this is endemic. We have to start treating this as uh, the equivalent to flu insofar as the way that we treat flu. Uh, Theresa May has been saying this for a while now. Uh, I'm not a big fan of Theresa May, but she's right about that. And, you yeah. know, ultimately, uh, this could be a turning point. I think when more and more people uh, of this kind of stature are saying, look, we have to learn to live with this. We have to find a way. Just boosting everyone every few months isn't, isn't going to do it. We have to find a new strategy. I, I think it's really positive. Yeah, I think it is as well. I think uh, already 2022 has a very favourable hue to it. But let's have a look. Now, if you're looking for good news, um, you might not find it in the economy, because government data is suggesting inflation could reach 7% if ministers fail to cap household bills. Um, it's a bit of a concern, this one, isn't it? It's bound to bring out Andrew and Josh's inner communist sensibilities, <laughs> <laughs> let's be honest, uh, with the independent reporting on the top 1% wealth. So, look, there's two stories there. There's uh, the rich getting richer and there's inflation. I mean, well, that's the, the real headache for the government now is actually not the pandemic, is it, Josh? But it is the cost of living. That is, I mean, it's gone up. They thought it was going to be 5 or 6%. Now they're saying it's going to be 7% because of uh, the heating bills, basically. Mm -hmm. And, I, uh, I mean, every time I read these stories, first of all, I have to try and understand what they, they mean. But secondly, uh, I just get really angry because I didn't get a fixed deal. And I kept yeah. on putting it off and I didn't go. And it was like, oh, I could just go on this. I don't mind being on that particular race. And then now I'm like, why didn't I just fix I, it? I'm never going to Vegas with you. I know. I'm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that was on You're offer. Basically, OK. Well, yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay. Next week, just get your PCR test. Well, not that we can afford it anymore. So you've been you basically had a sort of kamikaze ride with energy prices and you thought, well, that's it. I'll go. I'll go in unprotected. Let's I just say the fix. kids are at home freezing. Right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but this, this is going to be the hardy perennial story of 2022. Oh, it is. I mean, and this is going on and on because the, the, the figures that they're quoting are huge, right? Mm. It's not just there's going to be a few bills. It's a bit, it's, you're going to have to tighten your belts a little bit. Mm. It's stuff like, I mean, here it says in this article in the Mail, it's talking about how uh, energy bills could rise by more than 50%. So the average cost of household gas and electricity goes up to 2,000 a year. Yeah. And, that, you know, yeah. that, and that is not negligible, let's put it that way. You know, and it does sort of strike me uh, that because the government doesn't appear to be prioritising this enough, they're, they're completely out of touch. You know, for them, if they have to pay a few extra hundred quid on an energy bill, it's fine. It doesn't matter. Yeah. If you're a poor family struggling to feed your kids, mm. that's actually, it's, it's, it's an existential issue, right? Mm. Yeah. And so they just need to get on top of Absolutely. this. Absolutely. And it's that combined with everything else. It's all that sort of perfect storm, everything coming together at the same time as the, you know, they have to pay. Obviously, they've got a huge bill to pay for the NHS. Yeah. Everything's go just everything's going up and it's going to they're saying it's going to be possibly the worst since uh, I think 1992. They say since possibly. the credit crunch. Oh wow, so yeah. So it's and that you Remember everyone panicked about the credit crunch back in the day. Yes, I do. I was living But that was like the good old days now. In the good old days. Yeah. Everyone thought it was a breakfast cereal. No one knew what it was and then <laughs> yeah. and then it happened and it wasn't but it just, it just looked like the sort of the Queen's Garden Party compared to what we're going through now. I know. Just yeah. like Nick Clegg, Deputy Prime Minister. It's all a jolly jape, wasn't it? Just goes to show you can never predict no way. what's going to happen. Come back, Nick. All is forgiven. <laughs> uh, now, our next story uh, from the Mail involves the Playboy Mansion, copious amounts of cocaine and a canine. Woof, woof. Tell me more, chaps. <laughs> <laughs> I got this story. I demanded it. Um, 
So you just saw Playboy Mansion and Playboy Mansion, yeah, and, and I, yeah, exactly. I thought and poodles. So yes, <laughs> <laughs> it was written for you. <laughs> I yeah. might have lost the crowd with and poodles and poodles. <laughs> it's a big, a big poodle for me. Uh, so yeah, the big new documentary coming out, Secrets of Playboy. It's ten hours worth of behind the scenes. Uh, what was going? On. I'm going to leave it to my wife to explain to the children uh, about Playboy and cocaine. And um, what it was, yeah, one of one of his exes, um, the old uh, Hugh Hefner, who died a couple of years ago, one of his exes uh, revealed this story that his best friend is John Dante, who directed Gremlins. Brilliant. Yes, great film. Great film, right? And he had a dog, this poodle, who became addicted to cocaine. It was obviously just it was obviously just everywhere in the 70s. So he just found it, and then would jump up on people and could sort of identify. Became this like super drug dog. And maybe that is where they got the gremlin story from. Yeah. Just thinking after, you know, take this and, little and animal. how did they know that the dog was on cocaine? Was he really opinionated at parties? Very obnoxious. Yeah, quite boring. Yeah. Quite boring was, he, was he writing a screenplay? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's very hard to find. Well, he had a black nose. So oh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, very yeah. easy to spot. Well, it, it says here that he got addicted by licking the noses of the guests, that it would go up and lick the, the people's oh, faces see, and therefore yeah. get addicted. Mm. I don't buy it. I think the dog was doing it in order to get the cocaine. I think you, yeah. we have to go back to personal responsibility when it comes to drugs. And also, how Absolutely. annoying would it be to go to the Playboy Mansion and get licked by a dog? Well, I mean, they're quite cute, <laughs> aren't they? Oh, I see, you want to be licked by... It's not Human really beings. It's not really mission accomplished, is it? <laughs> so tell me your uh, Playboy Mansion story. Well, I got pretty close to a dachshund. Yeah. <laughs> this was a poodle, actually, Mark. It was yeah, a poodle, yeah. which, classy, of course, classy, classy dog. Yeah, famously yeah. intelligent dog. I mean, look, I, I'm very sort of conflicted about the legacy of Hugh Hefner because, I mean, he's an absolute genius of publishing, and yeah, yeah. Playboy was this amazing phenomenon. You know, he sort of doubled the circulation, like, from month to month, and, and within a year he was selling a million copies. Yeah. This guy changed the world. Yeah, and people have always said that the Playboy articles are quite sort of literary and quite journalistic. Yeah. And inter- yeah. I mean, John Updike and people like that used to write yeah. write short stories and other articles. What a strange way to punctuate your magazine, though, with with sort of naked images, and then you've got a John Updike article. It's an odd one, isn't it? But well, was it there it, just to sort of calm you down a bit? Is that what? The, is that, yeah. Was that the purpose? <laughs> I think, it's, like, it's like my set, actually. Like yeah, yeah. lots of knob gags, and then chuck in like a clever reference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what happens clever. with your set is that people are struggling physically to such an extent. You've got to throw in a little bit of rubbish. Just give just, it something you know, to get, yeah. get just through, to, just to bring it down. But it's I mean, like there's the, the beauty spot on, on uh, Cindy Crawford's face. Thanks, you know I mean? <laughs> but, but it does suggest, doesn't doesn't it, that this was quite a uh, hedonistic uh, environment? Uh, the fact that even mm. a dog can get addicted to cocaine while he's in the vicinity. That does Supposedly they yeah. had it stored under the toilet paper holder. They had like I mean, it would have been everywhere, yeah. everywhere. But I, that is not where I would, not that I ever have, uh, but that is not where, not where I would it. think would be a good place to be doing drugs in the toilet, sitting on the toilet. I don't think it's great. And of course, by the way, this is animal, very healthy. This is animal cruelty as well, isn't it? It's one thing for adults well, to speak ruin for their yourself. Lives. The dog might have enjoyed it. Do you think? <laughs> well, the dog, the dog did go up to people and lick the cocaine off their face. So the dog was initiating uh, this habit. I blame right. the dog. Yeah. yeah. And just bought rubbish for hours afterwards. Yeah. The dog had it coming. Uh, well, look, we've got lots to get through. Uh, this is Weekend Headliners. It's our second show. Of course, Headliners is now seven days a week, and we're here till midnight. Lots and lots of good stories to get through. Um, and I look forward to discussing after the break the health secretary and, uh, well, he came a bit unstuck talking to a big medic. Find out why after this short break and the weather. It's time to remind ourselves, there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Looking ahead to tomorrow's weather, and the UK is looking bright but chilly in the east with further blustery showers across western areas. Zooming into the southwest, and the showers will be focused across parts of Cornwall, Devon and Somerset, with places further east largely dry and a bright start to the day. The brighter skies will also be across southeast England and East Anglia during the morning. It will be a chilly start though with a touch of grass frost. Into Wales and there will be a fair few showers around which may be wintry across the higher ground. A few icy patches are also possible. A few showers may also move into the Midlands during the morning, but more so across northwest England where there will be quite frequent with sleet and snow possible over the hills. Moving across the Pennines, and apart from the odd shower, it should be dry first thing, with the best of the brightness towards the North Sea coast. A cold start, though, with a patchy frost. Into Scotland, and we could see some icy patches first thing, with showers affecting many southern and western parts. 
It will be drier further east, with some sunshine, especially for Aberdeenshire. Some showers will also move across Northern Ireland during the morning, where they will be accompanied by a blustery westerly wind. The driest weather will be towards the southeast of the country. As we head towards lunchtime, the best of the dry and bright weather will be in the southeast, with showers elsewhere. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello there, I'm Eamon. And I'm Isabel. And you're watching the GB News digital stream across the United Kingdom. And around the world. If you're here in the UK, you can also watch us on your TV screen. GB News is Freeview Channel 236. On Sky, we're Channel 515. 626 on Virgin Media. Just remember, you might need to retune your TV to watch the channel. Yeah, and if you are doing that, find out more about retuning by going to gbnews.uk. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Mark Dolan. You're watching Headliners, a comedic romp through tomorrow's newspaper front pages with the fabulous comedians Josh Howie and Andrew Doyle, who I hasten to add is firmly drug free. Now, have you heard of Karim Masimov? Slightly disappointed, but there you go. <laughs> During uh, January. Yeah, yeah, too, right. <laughs> have you heard of Karim Masimov? Well, me neither before today, but he's the former head of Kazakhstan's intelligence agency and he's been detained under suspicion of treason, Andrew. Yeah, that's right. And th this is, just goes to show the extent to which that the, uh, the Kazakhstan uh, government is not necessarily holding things together at the moment. Uh, I mean, you'll know what's happening here. There are these protests that all kicked off uh, back in January after the government lifted the price cap on liquefied petroleum gas. And, and obviously that means that a lot of people can effectively double the price. Mm. And then we had these uh, riots and they've been going on. And the Kazakhstan government has had to call in support from Russia and from other, uh, various sort of neighboring countries who brought a, a force in. They're calling it a peacekeeping force. The US is uh, dubious about that and is keeping an eye on this. Um, but all of this is happening. Um, and I think a lot of the people who are protesting about the fuel, I mean, it, ostensibly this is about the fuel. But it's not really. It's about inequality. It's about major inequality. If you think about Kazakhstan, it's got one of the largest oil reserves in the world. None of that trickles down. You know, we don't end up with the, the, the average wage there is really, really low. Yeah. So we get, we're getting these protests. It's getting very violent. And now uh, the, uh, the president has initiated a shoot to kill policy to keep uh, the uprising down. And I think a lot of this is also about, you know, the people in Kazakhstan, they perceive that this is just a continuation of the former regime. You know, because when the former uh, president stepped down two years ago, he effectively went back. He had a role on the Security Council. He was pulling the strings. Yeah. And this just goes to show now that he's, you know, even someone within the, uh, the, the body of government has been charged, it is falling apart. This guy was prime... I think this guy who's been arrested was prime minister twice yeah. himself, yeah. whatever. So he was absolutely part of the regime. But I love how the, uh, well, the observer said it. He said he was fired and also detained on suspicion of high treason. And I'm glad that they did both of those things. I don't know which one <laughs> no. was. Which one's the worst news to get? Yeah. I've lost my job. And, oh, yeah, by the way, you're now going to be high treason. 
So they're just looking to blame somebody. And obviously, it's, yeah, it's massive inequality there and corruption. Well, deeply, deeply troubling. Well, yeah, scenes. exactly. It's the uh, elites again. I mean, it's perceived as being a problem with the elites who have accumulated mass wealth. Yeah. You know, the former president accumulated and his family accumulated huge wealth. This is it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Although, I can think. I just say that Vladimir Putin became a billionaire through hard work and saving? Of course he did. Yes. And wrestling bears, I think. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And riding horses. I like the, uh, the US Secretary of State, Anthony uh, Blinken, did a, just a properly racist... <laughs> they're not going to make him happy, the Russians. This. He said, one lesson in recent history is that once Russians are in your house, it's sometimes very difficult to get them to leave. And I think that the, uh, the Russian ambassador is very upset, and he's done a statement from US Secretary of State Antony Blinken's house, where he's been for now two years since the party. <laughs> well, I've got a cousin like that. You want to see it? Dinner parties. You can't get rid of her. She won't take the hint. But there you go. Let's hope she's not watching. Now, Josh... Uh, What's all this COVID jib jabber jabber? I love this clip. I saw this clip online and I, it was just such a brilliant clip of this doctor. So, um, so David, David, David uh, Javid was in a sort of in a hospital. He was like, hey guys, everyone sort of masked up. What do, you, what do you think of the old vaccination thing? It was yeah. quite David Brent, wasn't it? Yeah, it it's was. Like, it was like, like a sort of storming session. And all these doctors and nurses all kind of really awkwardly looked at each other because they didn't want to say anything. And then someone, well, actually, I totally did something. And then they it, didn't go, it didn't go according <laughs> to plan. Well, we've got the clip. Let's have a oh, look. Great. What, do you, what do you think of the, the new rule to require vaccination of all NHS staff? I'm, I'm not happy about that. So. You're not happy about it, tell me. Yeah. So I've had COVID at some point. Yeah. Uh, I've got antibodies. Yeah. Um, I've been working on COVID ITU since the beginning. Mm. I have not had a vaccination. I did not want to have a vaccination. Mm. Um, uh, the vaccine's reducing transmission only for about eight weeks mm. with Delta. With Omicron, it's probably less. Mm. And for that, I would be dismissed if I don't have a vaccine. It's not, the science isn't strong enough. That's your view. And, and, and your view? Yeah. Hashtag awkward. What a great... Doesn't clip. know what to say. My favourite bit is the manager in the background who's just standing like... <laughs> he's like, his head is going to explode. Mm. It's so. always great when people take politicians to task. <laughs> just when there's a camera there. Because you know if there wasn't a camera there, Sergio Jeff might have just thumped him. Yeah, he just, just, just would have walked on. You can tell, like, he's just, oh, I don't know what to do with this. Because also, this guy knows a lot more yeah. about this than he does. Yeah. That's the problem. This guy like, saving he's, people's he's, lives. And, yeah. and he's just an eloquent, intelligent human being who's just stating a very reasonable case. Well, yes, I mean, I'm vigorously pro-vaccine and I've had really? three jabs. But I think it's got to be personal choice. Yeah. And I've gone right off this sort of vaccine rollout since it, it's developed a more sort of totalitarian well, flavour to it. But also, like as the doctor said, you know, the science isn't strong enough here insofar as if you have had COVID, you have antibodies, you have a, a su substantial degree of protection. He's just saying what we all know and what has been confirmed. There's nothing... Be careful with those dangerous facts, Andrew. <laughs> Yeah, I know exactly what you mean, but that is, but it is, it, no, you can't really dispute what he said. Notice yeah. that Sajid well, Javid didn't why, try to. That's why it had authority. Uh, he wasn't just some nutter in his mother's bedroom. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, he's not been on Facebook for too long. He's a respected medic. He faces uh, losing his job and his career. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, does it feel like a moment to you in the conversation around vaccines, mandates, passports? I mean, it could be insofar as I've always been slightly nervous uh, that with a new pandemic, a new disease where uh, medical experts are disagreeing with each other, there, is, there are disputes within sci the scientific community about these things. We've been sold this idea that there is a complete consensus on, about absolutely everything. Mm. And of course there isn't. How could mm. there be? And therefore, and, you know, with YouTube and various uh, big tech companies just shutting down any possibility yeah. of disagreement, that's not healthy for, for anyone. So I, I accept the point that at this sort of time, conspiracy theories run rife and that's not good either. Um, but we don't get to the truth unless you allow every voice to be heard, every expert voice to be heard within this conversation, you know? And they need to be doing more focus on the antibodies. And that's what they've sort of let go behind. A huge number of people, even before the vaccinations were happening, mm. had had the disease yeah. and were vaccinated. Why do we not know better figures about how protected you are and how that compares to vaccines? It, it, it needs to get out there. This person's saying they're basically comparable. Let's get some, you know, get proof. Yeah, too right. Well, that debate will clearly run and run. Now, our next story is from The Independent and involves the Blairs, who have always looked like the swingers next door that can never find other sexual partners. Isn't that right, Andrew? Oh, it, it, that is an <laughs> uncannily good description. You know, that's, they, a, that's real projection yeah. there. <laughs> Sounds like the Dolan's household, I'll be honest. But, I mean, look at them there. I mean, they do look a bit... You know, it's like that Christmas card they sent out very famously and that gets circulated every year and they look 
they look exactly like that, that sort of plain, sort of dead inside expression. But yeah. anyway, the, they were never out in the news. I mean, Tony just always pops up inevitably. But this knighthood thing, <laughs> this is what says because yeah. the Queen has sort of given him this knighthood and now there's this huge petition. I think it's gone over a million signatures now. People are really angry about it. Mm. And of course, inevitably, people are now digging up things that they can, dirt that they can throw in the hope that they'll stop Tony Blair from getting a, his knighthood. There was a war, supposedly. Well, the, yeah. war, the war stuff's already been tried and hasn't worked. Yeah. So now they're going for this, which is that he was claiming furlough money for members of his staff, right? Uh, and when he didn't need to. I mean, the argument goes that because he's very wealthy, he didn't need to do this. And a lot of wealthy people have refused the furlough scheme and covered it themselves, mm. you know? I can sort of see both sides of this, because on the one side, I saw, you know, actually the monthly claims that he were making were in the lowest uh, band throughout. It isn't uh, that much in the back. And he didn't break a law. He wasn't doing anything wrong. I really should emphasize that. Mm. However, there was all that thing at the start of the pandemic about, you know, we're all in this together. And I do think people with more, more means mm. should be stepping up and bearing the brunt of some of the uh, financial cost here. So I think, but I think what this is ultimately is just another opportunity to try and stop him getting the knighthood. I don't think that's going to happen. I think he, I think he's got it now. And I think he deserves it. For my mind, he was, you know, he's the best prime minister of my lifetime. So far. Is that what you think? I genuinely think. Uh, yeah. but do, do, do people always say, apart from the Iraq war. What about Iraq war? What they always say about Iraq. It was a mistake. I think yeah. he would acknowledge it was a mistake. Um, he doesn't. He well, absolutely I, doesn't. He th he thinks he's unrepentant about it. He I think there are things right. of it that he is repentant about in terms of the house and but but it, it look, I don't agree with the Iraq war, but it happened. It was always going to happen. Uh, he could sort of, I think he justifies himself that he tried to have some input into how it happened, and obviously that didn't work. People forget that the Tories in opposition supported the Iraq war. That, there's yeah. that as well. Exactly. And, there was yeah. a, and, and figures like Joe Biden, who was just a Democratic uh, uh, congressman at that yeah, time, yeah. he campaigned for the Iraq but war. But what he did do in terms of nationally, in terms of... Um, in terms of this sure start, in terms of funding for the schools, for NHS, these things made a big difference to people's lives. I mean, I'm with you that, you know, we, ultimately these knighthoods are given to prime ministers as a matter of course. Mm. It's a gift from the Queen. Mm. It's not a reward for political uh, achievement, actually. But And I don't think we should be arguing. But you'll notice that everyone who wants him not to get the award hates him and everyone who, who likes him thinks he should get So it becomes part of them. Yeah, I agree with you. He should, he should probably get it. But I don't think we should whitewash his... Past. I don't think he was a great prime minister personally. Well, who do you think was better though? Uh, Churchill was probably a bit no, no, better. No, no, in our lifetime. In our lifetime, Major, John Major. Because John Major did an awful lot for the uh, Northern Irish peace, Northern Ireland, peace, uh, okay. peace process. Yeah. Really what about David Cameron, who steered the country through oh the, uh, the uh, downturn and the credit crunch? He formed the coalition government. We had five years of quite stable government, didn't we? We did. <laughs> I, 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 we had a little thing called Brexit. There was that. that. There was that. So that was that was a positive. Uh, so we had that. Oh, I couldn't get over God. the thing that. <laughs> well, of course, he granted. He put the 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 the, uh, the referendum into the manifesto in order to see off. Yeah. UKIP at the time. Yes. That, by Nigel Farage, and uh, and it, and it worked because he, he he you know got enough votes to form a coalition to become prime minister. Well, exactly. I mean, you blame him for Brexit. Cameron didn't want Brexit. Cameron instructed everyone that was not was to vote for Brexit. It was a cynical move. And it absolutely backfired. And that's what makes him a terrible prime minister. Oh, didn't he just give us more democracy by granting the referendum? You fear it. I'm you on, fear the public. I'm on the wrong channel to be saying this. I'm going to get too many <laughs> Twitter messages after this. It's too painful. You should welcome them. Uh, but yeah, you fear the democracy. You fear the demos. The, the public should not have the voice. Look, mate, I just want to go to France and not have to fill out a bunch of forms. I mean, that's a fair point. But you do <laughs> raise a great question about who was the greatest prime minister, you know, in, in recent memory. And I've got to be honest, it's not rich pickings, is it? No, I mean, we're really all like, only 30, 31, so it's quite tricky. I think your best prime minister is ahead of you, Josh. <laughs> Thanks, mate. I hope so, too. Well, I'll be going into politics, so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> I think you can end, uh, endlessly argue about the merits and demerits of various prime ministers and whether they should get knighthoods, but ultimately it's just a convention that the Queen confers, yeah. you know, so I don't yeah. think we should worry too much about it. A confected it. rage. How unusual. 2022. Now you're bound to be furious about this one. Remember that strange mound that cropped up in central London, which served no particular function and cost £6 million? Well, it's closing up. So, chaps, what do we think? A waste of money? <laughs> <laughs> it's been over for a few months and it costs six million. But yeah, just possibly the biggest way. I mean, how, suppose, so the deputy leader, the Tory council's deputy leader, he's retired. How has the whole council not retired mm. over this or quit? I mean... Have you been to the mound? 
I know. I've seen photos and it looks absolutely... I love the mound. I think we should keep the mound. I think I'm going to join the campaign to keep it. Mm. I think it's great. I love the fact that we've got this monument, this, this tourist attraction that was created cynically to be a tourist attraction and no one knows why, is it, why it's there. That to me is... It's almost like avant-garde. It's, it's, it's yeah. really interesting. I don't know what it's for. I, it doesn't look good. It doesn't say anything. It wasn't designed by artists. It was designed by architects. So... It's funny. What right? does it feel it like the, the, plot line, <laughs> the plot line of the musical The Producers, where it was constructed to be unsuccessful? Do you know what it feels like? There's a novel by Kazuo Ishiguro called The Unconsoled, where the hero is running through town and he ends up running into a brick wall that's just there inexplicably in the road. And all these people say, it's just a tourist attraction we built. There's no po they're selling postcards of the wall. It's just there for no reason. And that to me is really funny. And I think we need something like that. And also, maybe this mound, maybe it was like Police Academy 7 Mission to Moscow in that a small number of people did enjoy it. Lots of people have gone to see it now. Why have we got to be mass market? Lots of people yeah. have gone to see it now because they know it's going to shut. And a lot of people want to see what the fuss is about. Actually, you know what? This is kind of reminding me of my Edinburgh show of 2008. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of money spent <laughs> for very little. Six million quid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And about four people visited. But also, you haven't seen it. So you might go and just, you know, you might have your mind blown Maybe by I'm this thing. Go. I, don't think, I don't see how it can be better than Shrek well. the, the, the history of architecture is littered with so-called white elephants that became iconic structures. So apparently the Parisians absolutely hated the Eiffel Tower when it was erected. It was meant to come down. Is that right? So it, was, it was a temporary installation, exactly. Remarkable. And it's still here today. Yeah. So maybe in 100 years' time, people will say, can you believe they almost got rid of this mound? Yeah. That's what I want there to happen. There you go. The wheel, there it is. There's the, the, wheel there it is there. the Millennium Wheel was, was going to and be there. And I hope those bins millennium. are still there as well. We've got a photo in there. Yeah, so the, I hope the, the bins are my favourite See, part I, I, I agree <laughs> with you. I, I actually, those lovely wheelie bins is a good enough reason to visit. Because, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, when, when I go into central London, I always bring litter with me. And it's nice to know I could just chuck it all into one of those bins. Exactly. I might, I might bring some sort of unwanted electrical goods as well. You know what I mean? Very, Perhaps a mattress. Very naughty. Very Never. Naughty. I wouldn't do that, of course. That's fly tipping. Yeah. So, there we are. Well, look, um, <laughs> long, long may uh, the mound continue. Uh, to those of you youngsters who enjoy burning the candle at both ends, it turns out you might be on your way to early diabetes. My team have put an exclamation mark at the end of that sentence. I'm not sure it's... Such good news. Uh, tell me more, chap. Yeah, it's, it's not good news. This is in the, da the Daily Mail. Uh, this is a study that has found that uh, teenagers who stay up late are at greater risk of problems. And the reason for this is... Watching this. Are we talking about... It's teenagers talking about, watching yeah. this now. Yeah, is like, it Josh's yeah. kids, basically? It's Josh's yeah. kids. We're part of the problem. We're creating the next generation of diabetics, apparently, because people stay up late and they take more sugar to stimulate themselves and therefore it can lead to problems such as... Uh, diabetes, and this has been published in a journal uh, called Sleep, and it assessed uh, almost 100 teenagers between the ages of 14 and 17. Mm. And I am sure that teenagers will study the findings of this research, reflect on it, <laughs> and modify their behaviour accordingly. Definitely. I have absolutely no doubt that will happen because you know teenagers are. Well, that's what what they do is they, they follow instructions. Always, they're known for it. Yeah. So I don't think we have to worry about this anymore, thanks to the study. Yeah. But, I mean, you didn't really need a study, did you, to find out that staying up late is probably bad for you? I don't yeah. think we needed that. Correct. And I think that people use sugar, it's like a drug, isn't it? It sort of stimulates you and you're feeling a bit low and it is a bit of a problem. But uh, I think, you know when um, you know when we get the social credit system, yes. right? And there's a chip in our skin and, and all that. <laughs> but I think all we have to do is add to that software um, that the government will check what time you go to bed. Absolutely. Have you a know. curfew. Yeah, and that's yeah. one bit of state control I could actually get behind because I quite enjoy an early night. Yeah, I'd have a healthier well, life. Well, I could get I behind the sending the kids to bed. There was a chip that would just literally switch them off. <laughs> yes. That or would just, or electrocute would... them if they didn't go to bed on something, time. Something that sounds very like... good. But I, this is when, a... you say, when you say if there was just a chip that could switch there's, them there's off, cowpole. do you realise how damning that's going to be <laughs> at the inevitable <laughs> trial in a few years' time? <laughs> Just yeah, it's it. out there now, saying, Josh. Oh, if gosh. only you could switch them off. Yeah. <laughs> Those uh, words will come back to haunt you. But, it, but there is a serious health message here. And let's just be, anybody, any teenagers, if you're going to do some stuff, some wacky backy, whatever, instead of getting Where did the that munchies... Come from? I'm just saying, instead of eating munchies and getting cheese balls, mm. just have some almonds. <laughs> almonds, that's, yes. I'm just saying, that's, that would be much healthier. That's it's basically really, really it's telling people watching now to go to bed. You're basically saying, why are you watching this? In day, 20 day? minutes when we... When we finish. When we, when we're yes, right you right. don't want to go just yet because we've got a lot more big stories from tomorrow's newspaper front pages, uh, including an absolute horror show in a posh restaurant. Quite the most shocking meal you've ever seen. We'll serve that one after this break.
Hello there, I'm Eamon. And I'm Isabel. And you're watching the GB News digital stream across the United Kingdom. And around the world. If you're here in the UK, you can also watch us on your TV screen. GB News is Freeview Channel 236. On Sky, we're Channel 515. 626 on Virgin Media. Just remember, you might need to retune your TV to watch the channel. Yeah, and if you are doing that, find out more about retuning by going to gbnews.uk. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. Headliners is an entertaining romp through tomorrow's newspaper front pages. Big opinions and big laughs along the way with the creme de la creme of British comedy talent. Seven nights a week. This is weekend headliners. I'll be in the host chair tonight and tomorrow night as well. And with me dissecting the big stories from tomorrow's papers, Josh Howie and Andrew Doyle. Now, our next story is from The Express and it involves a faux fair faux pas and beavers. Andrew, do you enjoy a good beaver? I love beavers, um, and I think... Uh, I know what you're driving at there. I think um, this is a story about the Queen's Guards. Now, they, you know, they wear the big beaver hat, the big the furry... The Queen's what? Guards. Story about the Queen's Guards. Okay. The Queen's Guards, and they wear these big furry hats, um, and now Peter, the uh, animal rights group, Peter has called on them to be made from faux fur, mm. because Peter's... A... Now, I have to say, so the, uh, the guards themselves, they say there is no alternative. This is an old tradition. This is a byproduct. so they don't go out and club bears and remove their skin. It's not like an initiation for the guards. Uh, that's not what's happening here. And I, I do find it difficult to take Peter very seriously because they're so extreme. Mm. And they always put out, I often think they're trolling, right? Like recently they put out a, a, a thing about how we need to not assume pronouns for animals. And they had a picture of a pigeon and they said, maybe this pigeon is they, them. Maybe, you know, maybe you wow. should respect non-binary pigeons. I don't really, they also did the thing about speciesist language where they said, don't use phrases like kill two birds with one stone, use um, feed two birds with one scone. And I think they're just See. taking the mix sometimes. So I don't take them seriously, really. And I think, I know, so I think I'm all for the beavers staying where they are. Yeah, the, the, keep, the keep, beaver the, keep the beaver where nature intended, perhaps. Yes. Oh, well, I'm glad that Andrew did the story because I thought it was pronounced um, fox. <laughs> faux was preferred. Glad you didn't admit that on that. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought... So you know, faux fur was fox, fox fur. fur. So I thought, oh, well, they want to do fox fur instead of bear skin. Yeah, yeah that sounds all right. That's pretty good. But, By the uh, way, there was a slight issue, because I'm going to try to be as sort of environmentally conscious as possible, but the issue you've got with making everything faux fur and, for example, vegan shoes. Yes. I mean, vegan shoes are, are essentially polyester or vinyl shoes. It's plastic. Yeah. Surely that's worse than using a bit of cow skin to well, cover your feet. Well, also, doesn't vegan mean what you consume? I mean, is anyone eating shoes? I don't think that's what it. Mm. I don't think that's what they should mean. They should. They, they need a different phrase for it, don't they? Surely. Yeah. Environment. Environmentally friendly shoes or something like that. But I think no. You're right. Plastics are worse for the country, the country than leather, aren't they? Are you checking your shoe now? Yeah, just, yeah. No, they're all good. These are good. You were just they, showing off your new trainers, good. weren't you? Um, yum, 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 yum. Yeah. I can smell them from here. <laughs> Thanks, GV News. These are great trainers. <laughs> Nicely done. Listen, when you've made a bit of money, it's nice to show it off.
Uh, now some sad news this evening, uh, and it's actually a really, really shocking news, so therefore quite a change in mood for this part of the programme. Uh, 56 people have been tragically killed by an airstrike in Ethiopia, with a th further 30 injured. Uh, Josh, what an absolute horrific story. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very, well, it's beyond sad, isn't it? It's a, it's a tragedy. And uh, the aid workers, uh, they've asked not to be named. Obviously, I'm sure they're afraid of uh, recriminations themselves, said uh, that, yeah, the number of dead has been confirmed by local authorities. And, I mean, it's not, uh, not it's nice, but I'm glad that we're actually talking about this because this is mm. a part of the world that wouldn't necessarily um, be talked about and something no. like this happens in that part of the world. And, and, and I don't think it gets the coverage. That what, I don't think people even know that there is you know, a war going on at the moment. No, and I think it's because the, um, you know, the hostilities supposedly have stopped, but the airstrikes are continuing. So they ha they've come to this agreement. The government obviously is, is um, uh, uh, there's a conflict between the government and the rebels mm. in the northern, era, uh, northern region. Um, and unfortunately, as ever with these conflicts, innocent people get caught up on it. Yeah. And this is what's happened here. An airstrike has killed, what is it, 56 people, 30 wounded people. It's absolutely horrific. Absolutely dreadful. And, uh, and uh, our sympathy uh, goes out to all of those involved uh, the most awful story. Now, uh, moving on, one in four police forces admit to not charging drug offenders. And it turns out one in four police officers take drugs. So I wonder if the two are connected, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, that was, I, that think, a joke. I, I believe that was a joke. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, we don't think it's one in, that we should just say that we at GB News do not believe it's one in four. For legal purposes, it's... Yeah. Our resident probably, lawyer, yeah, Josh. probably one in three. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, so basically, I mean, this is, you know, they've been talking for years about decriminalisation, but this is it in effect yeah. without any laws going into, into place. So uh, I think they've been watching a lot of uh, narco and the wire because they're talking instead about going for, like, the kingpins instead, mm. leaving the streets. Oh, are they speaking in, like, ghetto slang? Yeah, now? so they're like, we've got to get the kingpin. That's who we need to focus on. Mr. Uh, Mr. Big. Yeah, Mr. Big. Okay. Uh, and By the way, the boss, is, is, the boss is never just called Bob. Or oh, Steve or something. Yeah, it's always Mr. Z, isn't it's it? It's all Estevan. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is a bit. So, so uh, and they're offering, uh, instead of, you know, um, trying to put people in jail, uh, drug dealers now, what they're trying to do in Bristol, this is something they're doing, they're offering young drug dealers um, boxing sessions, driving lessons, uh, and employment opportunities. So, it, I mean, that's... A pretty sweet deal. Well, if you're a Bristol drug dealer, you can also get some free driving lessons. That's nice. That's pretty cool. But there's, there's something to be said, isn't there, for sort of going after the the crime, the criminals, rather than the people who are just possessing some, you yeah. know, shouldn't the focus be on, on those people? Yeah. And anyway, yeah. isn't it effectively the, the case already that it's effectively decriminalised? I mean, do the police really bother arresting someone if they find someone with some cannabis in London? I don't think they do, no, no, really. No, no. I mean, in Scotland, they're too busy addressing, you know, uh, arresting people who are dancing. On New Year's Eve. And yeah, yeah. Well, it's very serious. That kind of, you can put put out your ankle. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very dangerous. But also, like boxing lessons, driving lessons. Uh, do we want to make drug dealers more mobile and stronger? <laughs> yeah. That's better, what they're doing. Better fighters. Is that why? Yeah. Yeah. That's what it's yeah. for. <laughs> Crumbs. <laughs> Blimey. Okay, folks. Well, look, uh, we'll move swiftly on. Uh, depending on how you look at this next story, it's either a heartwarming tale of long lost love or a matter for the police, Andrew. Okay, so this is a man who uh, he had a love affair when he was 14, when he went on holiday to, I think, France. He went to France and he fell in love with a girl who was 13. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, same age, roughly. And now he's, uh, he's come, come across these old love letters that he got from her. You know, they both went home. They went their separate ways. It was a holiday romance. He's found all these love letters and he's decided, oh, no, I still very much, I'm in love with her. I need to be with her. And he's put out this message to try and find her again. And it depends on how you look at it. Uh, people on Facebook seem to think this is really lovely and romantic. Mm. But in his head, of course, she's still that... 13-year-old girl, I don't know what that means. I'm not suggesting anything or yes. casting aspersions whatsoever, but it does feel like arrested development, if it's anything, isn't it? <laughs> yes, because if you, if you root yourself and at a, at a positive experience when you were a child, I didn't have any, so I, I don't do that. But, you know, if you do that, then surely you haven't really grown up yet. I don't know him. I'm, I'm, I'm just doing this cod psychology, yeah. which probably isn't, is very deeply unfair of me, actually. I also, but, I mean, he's 25, and it's the way the article is laid out. It's like he's looking for his long... Like, you think it's someone in their sort of 60s right, who's right. trying to track that... How does he not know somebody from like five years ago he last spoke to? Yeah. Also, uh, can they fall in love at 13? Yeah. Is that real? Yeah. And I actually did loads of French exchanges when I was a teenager. I've actually Humble spent break. recent years, <laughs> I know, 
I spent most of my time trying to like lose contact with the people I met when I was 13. Yeah. Because they're amazingly annoying. But yes. uh, I just, uh, and also, have they not heard of email? Enough right. already with the letters. But um, I think it's quite a sweet story. And I think it, sometimes when these childhood sweetheart tales come to fruition, it's like, it's the most amazing thing. It does happen. Well, it's, it's probably just nostalgia, isn't it? It's just probably that he associates this with a wonderful time of his life when he was very happy. Yeah. You know, there's no way that he can... Yeah, yeah. I mean, she's, look, she's called Katie. Let's put... We've got a... We've got a platform here. Let's find her. She might well be a GB she, News. She could well be watching. But, you know, and let's get them together, see what their views are on COVID, on masks. But, but, but also... <laughs> <laughs> now you're talking. Uh, what the, trans rights. The, the, let's the, see if they connect together. The nerve-wracking thing for this guy is he's got to work out whether he's let himself go since he was a teenager or not. I mean, he looks like a decent enough looking guy, but I don't know whether he's improved. Like, you know what he looks like? Go on. He looks like Nick Dixon. <laughs> Does look a bit like Nick Dixon. Nick Dixon, another headliner. Another headliner, headliner yeah. star. Uh, but it might be that this guy has actually raised his game. Perhaps his acne has cleared up. Do you know what I mean? This could be, he's living his best life when you're moment. When you're 13, you are not the same person as when you're 25. Your frontal lobes aren't developed. You're not, you're a complete, and in fact, don't all of our cells regenerate every seven years? He's literally a different person at this point, and so is she. He needs to let it go. I hate to be brutal. Let it go. Oh, She's not interested. Oh, Tough love, sister. Yeah. There you go. Andrew's not pulling his punches. A trendy restaurant has shocked customers by serving up a decapitated duck head as their latest dish. Josh, would you be complaining about the bill? Well, <laughs> the bill? thank you. <laughs> very good. Not just thrown together this no, show. No, no, yeah, that's very exciting. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I would be complaining about the bill because it's 18 pounds for that. Uh, there we go. And someone on Instagram said, no, that's too much. Because as you know, you can get these about from McDonald's for about six quid. Yeah, but they mash them up and put them in <laughs> yeah. batter. Don't yeah, they? exactly. Yeah, same yeah. same difference. Uh, so, and I mean, I, I was actually very disturbed because it turns out their their most expensive meal is uh, duck breast, cabbage, and bacon, which that's twenty six pound. So I'm just thinking, how many duck? First, they're killing a duck to get the neck. They're killing a different duck for the for the breast. I mean, what are these poor ducks? I mean, they might I, use maybe they're using the same duck. I, I, the, I want to know what kind of monster would eat that. I mean, we're not French. We don't do things like that. That's absolutely vile. I mean, I, this is why I don't like this carnivores. Into the but I've always this thought we're meat eaters, and I'm a, a, a vociferous meat eater, but I think we're hypocritical that we sort of raise an eyebrow about eating a dog or a cat, but we'll eat a cow. What's the difference? No, that's true. I, yeah. no, I'm a vegetarian, so I do have the moral high ground here, and yeah. I judge all of you. Yeah. I don't think I you mean, should eat any part of it. I them. wouldn't say no to eating a dog that was high on cocaine. Is that right? Yeah. I think that would be a very, very interesting <laughs> I think, Mark, you should only be able to eat the animals that you kill. That's go. my view. Now you're talking. Yeah. Mm. That's a great shot. In, in that case, I'm immediately vegan because I'm go. a complete wimp when it comes to <laughs> catching and killing animals. But there you go. Uh, interesting stuff. Let's uh, move on now to The Times and Pretty Patel, who I think Josh has been watching a few too many episodes of Miami Vice. I was thinking Baywatch. Uh, ah, yeah. Man. So she. this is the thing. So th these are jet skis. Um, they've got three jet skis and she's desperate to get this... Uh, they haven't managed to do it yet because the conditions aren't right. There's only a certain part of the uh, of the channel they can they they can do it. But there's they want to basically get these jet skis and surround uh, the boat, the, the, the you know these dinghies, and then try and sort of push them back. Uh, there's obviously I mean this is not this is not a good idea. And also this would be a very bad episode of Baywatch. I don't want to see David Hasselhoff <laughs> turning turn get, migrants get back. I, mean, I don't think the British weather would suit him. I think all that fake tan would just... No, but he's got the hairy just... chest. At least that would help. Yeah. I mean, it would sex up an otherwise depressing story, yeah. wouldn't it? But, I mean, that's, I... that's all I'm trying to do. <laughs> just say... Isn't, that's, that's isn't what I there do. a better way? I mean, isn't really this about negotiations with the French government and trying to sort out a situation yeah. whereby these people are not uh, a feeling that they have to come across in the first place? Isn't there a better way of doing this rather than getting these... Jet skis and reenacting Miami Vice. Yeah, and, like, I mean, I there's there's is... a lot of uh, other stuff, and it feels like PR from yeah. the Home Office about you know processing applications for asylum uh, in other territories, um, you know, Eastern Europe and beyond. And it, it it seems like essentially, as you say, if we don't sit down with the French, there will never be a solution. No, but it feels as though the French are quite are, are not necessarily helping here. They're not willing really to get together. And it's serious. They're dealing with people's lives here, right? Mm. So this is actually quite important. Well, very yeah. important. But this uh, this particular tactic, they they have been doing this in different, like in the Mediterranean, and it just doesn't work because then yeah. people threaten to like jump off the dinghy or to sink the dinghy. Mm. Uh, dinghy. So uh, it's it's not it's not good. It's a terrible situation. Uh, 
and I really don't see a solution. There you go. It's a shame because I think a lot of people tune into this show for Josh Howie's solution. Absolutely. Well, this time, this is You've the one down. time. I know someone on Twitter it's... got like, what are you talking about, Howie? With yeah. you letting... I can't think of a humane way we, to we do it. We were going to get you to sort out Omicron, the cost of living crisis. I can do yeah. all those ones. Those are easy peasy. This is the one thing. It's, okay. It's, it's, this is tricky, this one. Even Josh Howie tricky. has been defeated by the channel migrant crisis. Well, there you go. Anything's possible. Uh, we've covered dogs tonight, beavers, ducks, and now whales. A football stadium <laughs> oh, resting uh, on the English and Welsh border is struggling with conflicting COVID restrictions. Tell me more, Andrew. I have no, I have no knowledge of football at all, but this was fascinating for mm. me mm. because the stadium, this is Chester Football Club, which is just on the border between England and Wales. And, and apparently the front gates and the main office of this stadium are in England. And then as you move into the pitch, you've moved, moved into Welsh territory. Mm. So, of course, it crosses this, uh, this boundary between the two. And now you've got this situation where uh, the Welsh government are saying, well, you've let you've m allowed people to basically uh, break. There's the, the mm. diagram, by the way, we can see where the border is. And effectively, the, uh, the stadium and the club have uh, broken lockdown rules inadvertently. But it just goes to show this sort of distinction. I mean, we saw this at New Year, didn't we, when all these young Welsh people were hopping over the border to, yes. to have New Year's Eve. Um, there's something about Wales and Drakeford I mean, particularly draconian and particularly, oh. I mean, he just completely defies, you know, he, he's, he's, ignore, he's ignoring evidence that the, uh, the, the worst of the Omicron wave has passed. I, I saw him do that speech where he talked about how Omicron was just as uh, virulent as other strains, even though a quick Google search would tell you that's not the case. I mean, it's, it's, I don't know what's going on in Wales. It's weird. No, and in fact, he's really trying to own this by saying that England is an outlier when it comes to COVID measures. It's like, I know, but look at the rates of COVID in England. Right. I mean, actually, even going back to Freedom Day, on the 31st of July, strict measures in Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales, yep. but nothing to show for it, potentially, in the data at least. Exactly. Mm. And why go after this football club particularly? Oh, it's ridiculous. But the, pro the, the places that have had stronger lockdown stuff, all it means is they're just a little bit behind the rest of the UK who didn't necessarily have those measures. Mm. They're still, right. People are still going to get COVID at some point. And that's where we need to be moving to, is a point where everybody's had it, hopefully mildly, of course, and then we're immune. Or vaccinated. There you go. You see, you're back to problem solving yeah. again. Yeah, yeah. He, he totally put out that fire. That's the Josh I reckon. It's over. <laughs> That's the Josh Howie we know and love. Uh, last but not least, we love this story. The Ark of the Covenant has been discovered by none other than the spoon-bending genius Yuri Geller. Josh, tell me more. <laughs> I don't need to tell you more. That's the story. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> I've just sent it out to everybody. Uh, yes. <laughs> He's using his psychic powers to find the Ark of the Covenant. Mm. Uh, anybody who has, uh, who has seen uh, Indiana Jones uh, will know what the Ark of the Covenant is. Or read the Bible. Or read the, or read the Bible. It's the better source or for this story, I think. I, I mean, say, God, uh, Indiana Jones, <laughs> pick a side. Yeah, as we call it, the only testament uh, in my household. <laughs> uh, the Torah. So, uh, yeah, he thinks it might just be in Israel. What a shock. OK. Uh, and uh, it's supposedly it's under the temple, uh, it, it, the Western Wall. I don't know if you know mm. Israel, you know the Wailing Wall. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That's where it supposedly is. And people are still looking for it and they think it's sort of... Do you think the authorities would mind if you turned up with like a little spade and started digging? Yeah. Yeah. I think they would mind. <laughs> so surprisingly, yes. Good for like, Yuri Geller. Yuri Geller's good at this, though. When he's when he's oh. sort of dropping off your radar and you've forgotten about him, mm. he'll come back with a, a kicker like this. He is amazing. Yeah. Like, you yeah. remember, well, that was a while where no one had heard of him for a while. Then he befriended Michael Jackson and everyone knew who he was again. Yeah. He's doing the same thing now, just with the uh, religious artists. It is remarkable, all the stuff with spoons. Are you a bender yourself, Josh? Big time. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you that Headliners is a seven-day-a-week <laughs> franchise. Well, it was until about three minutes ago. <laughs> I really want to thank uh, all of you, of course, for watching and to our amazing panel tonight, Andrew Doyle and Josh Howie. And of course, Andrew is back tomorrow with Free Speech Nation. Can't wait uh, for that. Uh, I'm back tomorrow from nine and I'm so excited because I'm back in the headliners chair at 11 tomorrow evening. We are seven days a week. Uh, we look at the papers, we deal with some serious stuff, but we have some fun along the way. Simon, Evans, Dominic, Frisbee, they'll be back next week. It's the Dream Team. I'll see you tomorrow at nine. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Looking ahead to tomorrow's weather, and the UK is looking bright but chilly in the east with further blustery showers across western areas.
Zooming in to the southwest, and the showers will be focused across parts of Cornwall, Devon, and Somerset, with places further east largely dry and a bright 